Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Justin Lam, and I'm the current director of pre-vet programming for the Pre-Health Student Alliance. Today, I have the honor of moderating this year's vet school admissions panel. Before we get started, I would like to thank the AAMC for sponsoring this conference and allowing this panel to be available for online viewers around the world. Throughout these past six months, we have collected questions from pre-vet students through social media and submissions on our online forums. Because pre-vet students have previously submitted questions, we will not be accepting questions from this audience. If you have any qu other questions throughout this panel, please feel free to submit them via Twitter or Facebook using the hashtag UCDPHSA14. I would now like to eat I would now like to have each of these distinguished panelists introduce themselves, starting with their name, their institution they're representing, and their current position at the institution. Starting with the first panelist on my left, Dr. or on my right, Dr. Elmore. I don't know if this is this on. Do I need to do anything? Uh, it should be. On. I guess it's on. Okay. Um, well, I'm Ronnie Elmore. I'm the associate dean for the College of Veterinary Medicine at Kansas State University. Um, the uh, Associate Dean for Academic Programs, Admissions, and Diversity. So I've been there 25 years working with students in admissions, and so I'm very happy to be here today. Thank you. Thank you again for having all of us. Uh, my name is Jennifer Maley. I'm Director of Admissions at Cornell University's College of Veterinary Medicine. Good morning. My name is Kim O'Brien, and I'm the Director of Admissions here at UC Davis. I'm Carmen Reamer. I'm from the School of Veterinary Medicine at Wisconsin at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I work as a, an advisor for pre-vet students who want to get in. Um, so it's a lot of fun. Thanks for having us. My name is Dr. Tracy McNamara. I'm from Western University of Health Sciences, College of Vet Med in Pomona, California, and I'm a professor of pathology. All right, great. Can we have a round of applause for these panelists? <laughs> So our first question is directed for uh, Dr. I mean, uh, Ms. Smaley. Um, so the question is, if you see an application with a GPA and GRE score lower than the standards of your school, what are you looking for in their application that might make you invite them to your interview? Well, so first we don't interview at Cornell, so we have a pretty extensive application process. 50% of our, our admissions formula, and we're very transparent about our formula, it's on our website. 50% um, is based in your, or rooted in your academics, uh, your GPA and your GRE. 50% uh, is subjective. I feel like I'm getting a little feedback. Um, is subjective. So we put a lot of um, emphasis on your animal veterinary experiences. We like to see really good letters. We need to see at least one letter from a veterinarian. Um, we'll look at letters from animal experiences as well. We put a fair amount of stock in your extracurricular activities. That's where you get the great leadership skills, the opportunity to be a good team player, um, the opportunity to have some balance in your life, to have a life. Really important to have a life in vet school, so if you come with that already in place, you'll be a good applicant. And then we have a lot of opportunity to do writing on our application, and we listen to your voice as well as your evaluator's voice. So that subjective side of the um, formula for Cornell, anyway, is the aha moment, the chance where you can really stand out and show what you've done with your life and um, your fit for veterinary profession and your fit for Cornell. OK, thank you. Uh, do any of the panelists have anything to add to that? I might just add real quick that uh, along the same lines, we look for three things. Documented academic ability, which uh, means not straight A's, but straight A's if you're capable of straight A's is not a bad thing, but strong A-B students. We look for community service, so we want people who volunteer in their communities, who truly care about their communities, um, and there's evidence of that in the application or during the interview itself. And then we look for knowledge about the profession. Do you know what you're getting into? Do you know what you're applying for? And so you get that by shadowing or working for a veterinarian. So those are the big three things that we look for, uh, kind of along the same lines in terms of uh, our applicants and, and those who are successful. So, so document academic ability, and it has to be documented. It can't just be, I know I can do it. Uh, I get a lot of calls from people telling me, I know I can do it, but their transcripts or their GRE scores don't demonstrate that they, they can do it. So it's got to be documented, community service, and knowledge about the profession. Great. Um, do any of the other panelists have anything to say? I think um, at Wisconsin, certainly that experience is such a huge piece. You 
you know, variety of experiences, especially with veterinarians. It's such an important piece. Of course, the, the academics are necessary. It, it's a tough program. We need you to do well. We want you to do well. So we're looking for that. But that, that knowledge of the profession is so important. At, at Western, because we have a problem-based learning curriculum where students work in small groups together, uh, we place a lot of emphasis on interpersonal skills and you know demonstrated ability to work with different personality types and um, you know and that we we really look for that in our interview and here at UC Davis a couple years ago we changed our admissions process so approximately 90 percent of our decision to interview is based on academics so GPA and GRE scores great thank you so this next question is directed at Dr. McNamara. And the question is, if an applicant wants to take a gap year, what is the best way to utilize the time from after graduation? Well, I think if you're trying to strengthen your application, maybe starting a master's degree in some related field um, to show that you're capable of doing graduate level work, um, maybe getting involved with research at your you know, university that you just graduated from, um, or working in a clinical setting. Uh, I think the more recommendations you can get from people in the veterinary field, the stronger your application will be. Can I come in as well? Sure. The, uh, you know, the schools differ uh, in how they select applicants or select student bodies. And at Kansas State, we don't put quite as much emphasis on the graduate degree uh, for the gap year. In fact, uh, our uh, admissions process is based upon the 64 hours of undergraduate courses uh, that you have to have. That's the foundation for our veterinary curriculum. And so I get this uh, question all the time, so will a master's degree help me become a better applicant? And generally at Kansas State, that's not the case at all. Doing well in those undergraduate prerequisite courses is what will help you have the foundation that you need to be a successful veterinary student in our program. So the answer that I would give would be that it's really individual. It really depends upon your background, where you've been, what uh, your application looks like at that time. And I often give advice on uh, either retaking courses to build that foundation that we know is gonna be important when you get into veterinary school, retaking the GRE uh, exam perhaps, uh, if that's something that you can uh, do, uh, improve on. There's just a number of different things and so it's very, very individual. Uh, as to what we recommend for the gap year. Great, thank you. Do any of the other speakers have anything to add? Yeah, I agree completely. It's very individual. Um, it really depends on what you feel might strengthen your application. If a master's is um, going to help your GPA and your academic background, go for it. If you need some more veterinary experience, animal experience, the opportunity to get some breadth, that's a good way to go. So, so very individual. And at UC Davis, I would say the same as Cornell. Um, if you have a gap year and you need to improve your GPA, um, you can go into a um, post -bac program or a master's degree, or you can also just take a variety of upper division science courses that might help you in the veterinary curriculum to improve your GPA and also um, look at your GRE scores. And if they're not competitive, plan to take them over again. That is always you know, the best thing about the GRE is that you can take it over again, right? It's not something we want to take over again, but you can. Um, so I agree. You know, so many different things that you can do with that gap year, so it depends on what you need to strengthen. Great, thank you. So this next question is directed at Miss O'Brien. So the question is, how much do schools value consistent involvement in an organization? In organizations? Um, in like a student group on campus. Okay. Um, at UC Davis, since our admissions process has changed, um, we place all of our emphasis on academics. So 90% is based on your last two years GPA and your cumulative science GPA. And we also look at your quantitative GRE. So 90% is what's going to get you to the point of being invited for an interview. Um, but it is always very helpful to be involved in student activities and leadership, community service, all of those things help enhance your application. And also when it comes to uh, getting your letters of recommendation, those are all things that help an evaluator write an, a recommendation for you. Do any of the other speakers have anything to add? 
again, I'd, I'd comment that it depends on the individual situation. Uh, we put some emphasis on those sorts of things. Um, involvement in our pre-veterinary club, for example, on our campus, those sorts of things. However, if a student uh, is working or you know, working to pay their, for their education, uh, that may take away from the time that they actually have to be involved in other uh, school activities. So it's got to be a balance. And uh, we look at each individual holistically to see, okay, what is your total package? Uh, you know, what, what other things are you committed to? And uh, so our uh, admissions committee will often ask a student, so why weren't you, weren't you involved in the pre-veterinary club? Uh, if there's a good answer for that, uh, you know, perhaps a uh, single parent or uh, somebody who has to work or, I mean, there's just all kinds of reasons why they couldn't be involved. And so, so we look at that holistically. I always tell students are always looking for what, what an applicant needs and what the faculty want to see at colleges. And I, I try and turn it back to the student. You want a balance in your life. What do you want? What do you want to be involved in? What makes your life enriched by this? And whatever that is, that's going to be the right thing for your application. So, so don't always target your whole life around what do the faculty want? What enriches you? What makes you a better person, a better candidate? Um, uh, will help you with vet school. That's the good way to go. Great. Do any of the other panelists have anything to add? All right. Thank I, I you. I might also oh. comment real quick too. Good. Our last speaker talked about diversity and. We think that's so important at Kansas State University. Diversity in every sense of the word, not only just race and ethnicity, but uh, we look at uh, diversity in terms of backgrounds as well. And so uh, if you can demonstrate to the admissions committee that you're gonna bring something to the profession and to that class, uh, that's important. And it may not necessarily mean that you're a member of a certain organization or not. Great, thank you. Um, so this next question is actually directed for Dr. Mel Elmore. So if a student has, bad, has had a bad start in their undergraduate years, let's say freshman or sophomore year, and they show an improvement in their later years, how much does that factor into the selection criteria? Well, it, it factors in a great deal, actually. Uh, we understand that right out of high school that a lot of students are not good time managers, they're not uh, you know, accustomed to being away from home and uh, doing all the things that, for themselves. And so uh, we're more interested in the last three semesters than, than we are in the first three semesters right out of high school. So we look at your last 45 hours of undergraduate work. Uh, that's the last 45 semester hours. I know that UC Davis is on a quarter system, so the last 67 hours. Um, and that's far more important to us than the first, uh, first 67 hours of the first 45 hours of semester-wise. So it's, uh, sure, we know there's a lot of people that stumble. We understand there's a lot of people that uh, come to veterinary medicine through as second careers, and uh, part of the reason for that is they didn't do so well during their uh, previous life, but they've got their act together, they uh, know this is what they want to do, and uh, now they've got that foundation that we talked about earlier in terms of being uh, able to be successful in our program. So last 45 hours are far more important than the first uh, 45 hours. The other thing is we don't use overall GPAs at all at Kansas State. Uh, we feel like they're totally meaningless because they can be so easily manipulated and uh, what do you put into the last 45 hours? We've talked this morning already about graduate degree programs. We've talked about undergraduate programs. Uh, there's just so many different things that go into and overall that we don't use those. We use the last 45 hours. We use the uh, GPA on our prerequisites. And then we look at the science GPA and specifically the science courses on our prerequisite list. Because again, we know that's the foundation for our veterinary curriculum. So. Uh, you have to demonstrate, document that you can do well on those courses. Great, thank you. Uh, I agree. Um, we look for a trend, a rising trend, and um, we look at your science GPA and your overall GPA. We're most interested in your science GPA. And you always have a chance to address the fact that, oh, I, I was partying too much my first semester. <laughs> you know, be honest about it in your essay and say, but you know, I've matured, I know what I wanna do, and you can see that, you know, since that time, I've been, you know, I've excelled in the sciences, and, and so there's a way to get around that. I agree as well. You know, we look at the last 30 credits along with the undergrad GPA and the required coursework GPA, but you know, we, we also look for trends, so certainly you wanna if you're gonna stumble, it's usually in that first year or so, and then pick yourself back up, right? And keep going and keep taking courses. And sometimes if you don't get in your first try, you also continue to take courses, and that can become part of your 
last 30 credits if you have to apply again. So we look for trends. And we also look at the last 45 semester units. Um, usually those are courses that are upper division, so we're interested in those courses. Um, and then we also look at your cumulative science. We, we no longer look at a cumulative GPA. So we don't count your first year as well. We look at it all. We look at your cumulative grade point average. We look at your semester by semester, your courses. We are very holistic in the application. We want you well prepared. We will look at your prerequisite courses. You don't have to be a science major. We have religion majors, Spanish majors, English majors. You can come in with any major. We will spend a lot of time looking at your prerequisite courses and make sure you're well prepared in the sciences, but we're very holistic in looking at your entire academic record. I, I might come in real quickly too. The last speaker talked about the attrition rate, and for all of our schools, the attrition rate's actually very, very low, and so part of all of this is trying to determine, are you gonna be successful in our programs, in our individual programs? And so uh, I think all of us have tried to say, it's not just uh, any one thing, it's really uh, mm -hmm. trying to put people into the programs that we know are gonna be successful, because we know that putting people into the program who are not likely to be successful is not good for that individual and it's not good for the institution as well. And so uh, we, I often tell students, and it's absolutely true, we don't admit students to see them fail. We do everything within our powers to help them be successful, but obviously you still have to do the work, uh, but we wanna be as much as we can up front, uh, absolutely certain that you have the ability, you've documented you have the ability and the drive to do it and it's gonna happen. So. Uh, I think we've all kind of said the same thing in terms mm -hmm. of uh, it's really all about your success. Great, thank you. Um, so this next question is directed at Ms. Reamer. And the question is, what are some important factors to consider when deciding which vet schools to apply to? So many different. Um, so some students apply to everything, right? Every single uh, program out there, which can be very expensive, so cost is one thing, uh, tuition, um, you know, applying to schools, and I'm always amazed that students apply to schools that they're really not going to if they get in. So pick schools that you're interested in, you know about their program, visit the schools um, if you can, or at least go online or, you know, talk to an advisor like myself, even if you can do it over the phone to get a feel for that program, um, and see where your interest lies. And, and of course, that residency issue is a big one as well. So a lot of different factors to think about when selecting schools. Yeah, I mean, obviously, if you're interested in pigs, you're, you're gonna go to Iowa State. Um, if you're interested in poultry, maybe you're gonna go to North Carolina or University of Georgia. It depends on what your interests are, and you have to do your you know, due diligence, research the schools, and see what the strengths of you know, each individual school might be. Um, but that being said, any school that gives you a DVM is the best school in the world. <laughs> um, do any of the other panelists have anything to add? I, I'd just add that, um, you know, you need to pick out those schools that you want to go to. Go and visit them if you can. Uh, actually, physically go visit them. See if the town feels right. See if the university feels right. See if the college feels right. See how you're treated. Um, see if you leave feeling, this is a place for me for four years, because four years is not insignificant. And, uh, you know, if you can, it's nice to visit those schools. That's one reason that, we, reason that we still do interviews because many of you in this audience, I'm sure, probably have not been to Kansas and you probably envision this as a flat field, uh, probably with wheat growing on it and uh, enough wheat uh, cut to put the veterinary school in the center of it. Uh, it's not that way at all. We want you to come see us. We want you to actually get on campus and if you make a decision to come to our school because we've given you an invitation to do that, we want it because you really want to be there. And so. Uh, go visit the schools, just see how it feels. And if it doesn't feel right, then there's other options. And so uh, I'd encourage you to, as much as you can, and realizing that for a lot of you that won't be possible, but at least do the telephone calls, do the, uh, talk to some students, talk to people that are there and see, how was I treated? Is, is this gonna be a good thing? The, the process isn't all that different than choosing your undergraduate college. Mm -hmm. You're looking at fit, you're looking at the curriculum, you're looking at the faculty. What I tell students is don't do the admissions committee's job for them apply, let the committee see your application and make the decision. As long as you think it's a good fit, then, then give it a go and see how things go, but a good fit. 
That's really important. Um, we always advise applicants to look at the town. Do you like small town, large town? Look at the weather. Um, are you going to be homesick if you're away from home? Uh, there are things like that that are really important. If you have a certain sport that you've been involved with for a really long time, soccer, water polo, anything like that, um, and you might want to still be involved, you need to look at schools that may provide that for you, um, extramural or, or competitive. There's not much time to be competitive <laughs> while you're in vet school, but yeah. um, it really is a whole package that you need to take a look at. I had a student come in to me two weeks into the first semester, one year, told me that she was dropping out of veterinary school. So. <laughs> I asked her the reason for that, and she said, well, the surf just isn't high enough here. <laughs> well, we're in Kansas, you know. Yeah, I can't do much about the surf. Uh, we have a lake north of us that's very large. When the wind blows, uh, you can see ripples. But uh, beyond that, that's about it. So if that's really important, then, you know, probably Kansas isn't the place. Great, thank you. Um, so this next question is actually open to any of the panelists. Um, so the question is, how are vet schools addressing the high cost of vet, vet schools? Um, anyone can start. I'll, I'll take a stab at it. We're, uh, we're working really hard in terms of scholarships and uh, programs that provide for educational funding. Uh, we have about 11 or 12 students in our uh, student body right now that are on military scholarships. Those are full ride uh, with a living stipend with uh, books and supplies and everything bought. It's absolutely wonderful what you go through veterinary school, in my opinion. It's not for everybody, but we work really hard with those. We have some debt forgiveness programs within the state. We have some, we work with our students all the time about other debt forgiveness programs from their states or federal uh, debt forgiveness programs. Uh, last year, we distributed about a million and a half dollars to our student body for scholarships. They're, they range uh, from full ride scholarships to lesser scholarships, depending on interest, and of course our fourth year students get more money generally than our first year students because they actually have academic records and scholarship to base scholarships on. Um, so, and then we're working with outside agencies all the time. For example, I've seen uh, checks made out for $15,000 from the American Kennel Club to our students. Um, you know, that's just totally outside of uh, the veterinary school uh, sort of program. But we work really hard to identify all of those programs and I'm constantly sending emails to our students, apply for this, apply for that. Uh, you, you're probably a qualified applicant for this. Anything we can do within our powers to help you get that money, we will help you do. And so, um, and then beyond the scholarships, we have uh, counselors who come to our uh, facilities. They're there every week. Uh, students can go and talk to them about budgeting, about financial sorts of things. Uh, we work constantly, we, we have a business club. We talk a lot about finances in that club. There's just all kinds of ways that we actually try to help our students uh, uh, diminish their the amount of money they have to spend, or de decrease the amount of money they have to spend and, and uh, get out with as little educational debt as possible. Yeah, I think we're all that way. We're really working hard to help keep debt down. Our, um, our financial aid office is not called a financial aid office. It's the Office of financial, Student Financial Planning. Um, we are fortunate to have an endowment, so we do offer merit-based and need-based scholarships and grants. Um, we work really hard with students to understand the debt keep it down based on your lifestyle. It's um, about tuition, but it's also how you live and how you decide to manage your life. We run workshops, programmatic and things um, that will help you. And also looking at some loan forgiveness programs as well within the institution. And that's true with Davis as well. We have a pretty robust uh, scholarship program, but we also do some financial advising and we work with our, since we're a state funded school, we work with our legislatures to try and uh, keep the cost of vet school as low as possible. And similarly at Wisconsin, um, we work very hard to increase scholarship dollars and to talk to students about managing their debt and trying not to take out loans for living expenses. You know, many of our students work part-time to help themselves. Um, we try to keep our tuition low. You know, we're the lowest non-resident tuition um, in the country, very low for residents as well. So we work really hard on helping with the debt load. At Western, we're a private university. We don't receive any state funding. So we work very hard on um, obtaining scholarships for our students, and we have someone who's dedicated to that full-time you know, coming up with scholarships our students can apply for. Great, thank you. 
Um, so this next question is also open to any of the speakers. So the question is, what are some common mistakes applicants have made during a vet school interview? And anyone can take it. Uh, I had one who came in and said when we, you know, uh, that he wanted to be a veterinarian because he wanted to make a lot of money and work short hours. <laughs> I was like, no, I think you mean the medical school. <laughs> um, that, that one really stands out. But, um, you know, the other one is people who say, you know, I only want to do veterinary medicine because I love animals, but I don't want to work with people. Well, I've yet to see a dog or cat walk into a clinic um, and open the door. They, they're attached to a leash and attached to an owner. So, you know, uh, you need to be good at both. You need to love animals and have the ability to work with lots of different kinds of people. So we don't interview, um, we don't interview, but I certainly agree with, you know, those communication skills are so important. I always, when I talk to students and I hear that same thing, I wanna, I wanna be a veterinarian because I love animals and I, you know, I don't really care for people. I'm like, mm. you know, you have to at least like people, right? And that's something that we're looking for, that you are able to work with others. So um, maybe, you know, maybe talking way in depth about, um, personal issues uh, going on and on in your personal statement sometimes. You know, I talk to a lot of students about their personal statement. And here at Davis, uh, our interviews are MMI, which is multiple mini interviews. So that's a little um, different to get used to. Uh, the best thing you can do to get prepared for that is to look up some YouTube videos to kind of see how it all works. Um, but just in your MMI and your interviews, um, to be articulate, to present yourself well, professionally, um, empathy, compassion, those kinds of things. Yeah, we don't interview at Cornell, so I can't help you with this question. I would say we, we interview, and um, one of the, the things that we see where students fall down a little bit is that they're not consistent in their interview and their application. Uh, we don't require experience in all areas of veterinary medicine. In fact, uh, I get that answer, that question all the time. So do you expect us to have uh, experience before we come to veterinary school in large animals, small animals, equine, exotics, whatever it might be? And the answer is absolutely no. But we do usually ask at the, some point during the interview, so what are your career goals? Realizing that most of you will change your career goals at some point along the way anyway. Uh, and that's okay, but at least it gives us some indications you've been thinking about, okay, this is how I might serve society if I'm a veterinarian. But if you come and tell us that you want to be the best feedlot veterinarian that's ever graduated from Kansas State University on graduation day and you've never set foot in a feedlot, that's <laughs> not being consistent. And so uh, I would say that uh, that's part of, uh, or one of the biggest things that I see, that it's okay to want to be a feedlot veterinarian and you can become one if you've never set foot in a feedlot. It just means that you're going to have to do some additional things before you get there. It's, uh, so sometimes our uh, admissions committee looks for consistency, uh, consistency of, uh, both in interest and in uh, the uh, performance and all those sorts of things. And so I'd say that's, uh, that's one area. Our interviews are very conversational. They're very traditional. Uh, it's all about getting to know you. Um, the, what the admissions committee is looking for, again, is to see uh, if you have a reason for being in, the, in our student body, if you have a reason for wanting to be in the profession, if you've prepared yourself well, well to be in the profession, uh, how you're going to fit in, all those sorts of things. Obviously, you don't want to insult the uh, interview committee when you're in, in the interview room. And so all of those sorts of things are things to think about. Uh, we've had students who have tried to outguess our uh, admissions committee. Uh, I can tell you they are well prepared. They know your applications extremely well. And if they ask you or if they say something like, I noticed on your application, whatever, for example, you worked on a farm with 6,000 zebras, uh, the correct answer is not, Oh, did I put that on there? Uh, you know, because they will know your applications very well, and um, and so um, you need to know your applications very well as well. So it's really all about getting to know you. You're the expert in the room. You know yourself better than anybody else in that room, so you shouldn't be intimidated. Although I realize it is a little intimidating, but uh, but still, uh, it's all about just getting to know you and see uh, if you've got the total package. Uh, at Western, we use behaviorally based interviews where we ask the same questions of each student that comes through. And, you know, the questions are designed to help us see how you handle adversity, how you handle, you know, difficult people. Um, you know, if, if you've had, 
uh, a time when you were disappointed in your own performance, what did you do about it? And um, our entire faculty is involved in the selection of the class. We don't have a, um, an admissions committee. The, every faculty member reviews files. Every faculty member is involved in um, interviews. We actually have the behavioral questions within our supplemental application, so you have a chance to articulate a lot of that information you might in an interview in our application. I, I might add, too, that your application, and this wasn't specifically the question, I don't think, but uh, we see so many applications that it looks like they were probably written the night before they were due, mm -hmm. and you, I think, probably get the idea. I always tell applicants, if you're serious about this, uh, check the grammar, check the spelling, check to make sure that you're even using the right word. Uh, have somebody that you can trust uh, read your application and um, you know, at least make some suggestions because uh, this represents you. Uh, if the application comes in, it's really sloppy and there's misspellings and there's grammar, uh, grammatical errors, and I've seen uh, applications with red marks all over them and comments from our interviewers, uh, you know, this is not a good situation uh, in terms of uh, what the application even looks like. And uh, so it does represent you. It rep represents your very best. And so uh, just keep that in mind that whenever someone looks at that, what are they going to think of me, uh, you know, seeing this? That's right. Great. Thank you. And I just want to remind the audience that there's only five minutes left for the panel. And um, so this next question is, Directed for Dr. McNamara, and uh, or at least or any of the panelists could add to it too. But um, what has been what is one of the most outstanding applicants uh, applications you've seen? Um, or could, sorry. Let's see. I guess it was someone who had a tremendous amount of personal tragedy with cancer and you know loss of a parent and you know. I've, very difficult personal life who persevered and you know was working different jobs and just demonstrated an incredible maturity uh, for someone that age and um, commitment to the field of veterinary medicine a commitment to excelling in the sciences and um, that that made a deep impression on me and it showed that kind of person is going to have the maturity to handle the intense caseload, you know, the workload that you have in vet school. And, um, you know, so I, 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 I think the work ethic and the ability to deal with, you know, tough situations mean a lot to me. Great, thank you. Do any of the other panelists have anything to add? Or want to share a memorable applicant? I, we have so, so many wonderful applicants. I don't think I can isolate anyone to that extreme. The, um, you all are wonderful. You bring something different to every applicant and every application. We'd be lucky any of our schools to have you. Um, so uh, whether you've had something really extreme happen to you or you're just plugging along being the best you you can, um, don't, don't aspire to be anyone but yourself and you'll have a great application. Agree with that. Can I can I address something we talked about earlier sure. because we're running short on time? But you know, thinking about exploring schools, I've been thinking about that a little bit. Uh, it is important to go back and kind of look at what um, the educational experience is going to be like for you at the schools. And uh, at Kansas State, our uh, philosophy, our approach to veterinary education is very broad based. We require that you learn about all the domestic species: uh, cat, cow, goat, sheep, horse, pig, dog, whatever. Uh, and you have the opportunity to emphasize areas that you're most interested in. We also have a really good program in exotic animal medicine for exotic animals. And so some schools, uh, you know, uh, re they, they use tracking or other methods uh, in terms of their programs. Uh, and I'm not uh, being critical of those schools at all, but I'm just saying you need to kind of think about, okay, where do I wanna, what do I want the end point to look like? And so we feel for our graduates, uh, being in the Midwest, that having a very broad-based, very educational experience encompassing all the domestic species uh, serves our graduates better than uh, allowing them to leave some out. Um, and so, you know, think about those things as well. What's the program really going to look like? Uh, what kind of endpoint am I going to get to uh, after having gone through that program? And so I think that's an important thing to, to think about too. 
Great. Do any of the other speakers have any last minute comments? Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, we, we mentioned earlier, we don't care what your major is. Uh, I was a French literature psychology major from a small liberal arts college and didn't decide to be a veterinarian until my junior year. And I came back you know, from my junior year abroad in France and finished my degrees and then went off to Africa for a semester and that really solidified my, my career goals. And I came back and you know, it was like, oh my God, what am I gonna do now? It's gonna be a whole year to take all the prerequisites and then it's another year to go through the application process. And my parents gave me the greatest gift that a parent can give. They said, someday you're gonna turn 45 years old and we just hope you'll be doing something you love. So if it takes an extra year or two, it doesn't matter. You're young, you know? Just do whatever you need to do to get into vet school and put the time in and, um, and don't lose heart. I'd like to add too that I'm gonna be over at the career fair. I know mm -hmm. some of you will be over there. So uh, if any of you have individual questions yeah. today and tomorrow, come over and see us at Please the career come fair. Come over Please. to our tables and Ask your individual questions, and yeah, so Be that's proud what we're here to for. talk to you. I would be happy to talk. Yeah. To you. and I'm lecturing this afternoon twice on my involvement in the discovery of the West Nile virus and how that has really it served as a launch pad for the creation of the One Health movement and the power of veterinary medicine and the role we play in the larger stage. So you're welcome to come to that. It's in Young Hall. Great, thank you. So can we all give a round of applause?